moment of truth opened up my eyes. A moment of truth. A moment of truth like the sunrise. A moment of truth. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to the Moment of Truth. This is Live at Five with your host, Dr. Harold G. Dakers, Jr. Welcome, everyone, this morning for our morning session. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for blessing us this morning for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Thank you for your bountiful many blessings. Thank you for all the things that you have done, for watching over us last night, for keeping us and awakening us this morning, clothing our right minds with the activities of our limbs. Now we ask that you would, in this time that we have come to share in thy word, let our hearts and minds become good ground. We would receive the seed of thy word and then bring forth good fruit unto good measure. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Let's get started this morning. This morning we are going to be talking about the extreme unction. Uh, one of the other, uh, I guess, uh, purported powers that popery has vested upon itself. Uh, let me go to the, um, let's see. Look it up in the uh, straight answers section. Uh, let's see, we want to talk about uh, what is it? The uh, let's see, extreme function. See it there. There we go. <laughs> All right. There are a few things that they are going to bring up. Okay, let me go in here now. Oh, I'm going to go with their version first. Then we're going to talk about... Uh, with our textbook according to Hisla uh, what they are really oh, here we go alright there we go alright so what are anointing of the sick and extreme unction now this is what of the hmm practices of the church. Let me go back to something here. I wanna uh oh come on. Am I in here? Yeah. That's what we This is one of the doctrines and disciplines of the church in Rome. And 
Oh, excuse me. The 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 pretense for this is of dying men, and they they use as their um, well, they're gonna mention a few scriptures here, but they found this on uh, James when he says, "If there are any sick among you, let him call for the elders." And, they would anoint him and pray, and uh, they shall. Let me, let me hold on. Hold on. Uh, is any sick among you? Yeah, let them you know, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. This is uh, uh, an instruction of the Bible regarding. Oh, excuse me. When one is <clears throat> ill or sick. But let's see what uh, the church in Rome uses this for. During his public ministry, Jesus healed people, the blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, and you. The hemorrhaging and the dying, you know, the woman with the issue of blood. His healing touched both body and soul. In most of the accounts of the healing miracles, the ill person comes to a deeper conviction of faith, and the witnesses know that God has visited his people. These healings, however, foreshadowed the triumphant victory of our Lord over sin and death through his own passion, death, and resurrection. So they open up giving an explanation about this by using the example of Jesus <clears throat> laying hands on the sick and um, also um, that this is a precursor to his own sacrifice and the victory that he will bring over sin for the whole world. Now, okay, they open up with a, you know, a statement we could, you know, okay, I can accept that. I'll go on with that. And then they go on to say, the healing ministry of our Lord continues through his church. Now, he instructed the apostles and sent them out on mission. With that, they went off preaching the need of repentance. They expelled many demons, anointed the sick with all, and worked many cures. At the ascension scene, Jesus echoed the instruction to the apostles and declared that the sick among whom they laid their hands will recover. Yeah, now remember, he says, uh, these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They shall speak in tongues. They shall cast out demons. But, you know, he gives the, that's in the book of Mark. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit conferred great gifts upon the church, including healing. And we read that in 1 Corinthians 12. And I think they make reference of that as well. St. Paul recognized through the Spirit one received faith. By the same Spirit, another is given the gift of healing. Okay. You know, they, 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 they stick into the script pretty much right there in their, you know, uh, answer to this unction, but let's keep reading. Then they go, the apostle, St. James, you know, they make everybody a saint, provided a clear teaching regarding the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Now, here's where they, now they have made this now a doctrine or a discipline, and they call it the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Is there anyone sick among you? He should ask for the priest of the church. They in turn ought to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. This prayer uttered in faith will reclaim the one who is ill, and the Lord will restore him to health. If he has committed any sins, forgiveness will be his. 
In all, the church has been continually mindful of our Lord's command, heal the sick. All right. Various church fathers attest to the use of this sacrament in the early church. Augustine, in 430, wrote that he was accustomed to visit the sick who desired it in order to lay his hands on them and pray at their bedside. From his writings, it is probable that he anointed them with blessed oil. He said, they say it is probable. Pope Innocent, in his letter of instruction to Decentius, affirmed that the letter of James clearly refers to the sacrament and that the bishop must bless the oil. A bishop or priest must administer the sacrament, and the sacrament complements the sacrament of penance conveying the forgiveness of sin. About the 12th century, this sacrament became commonly known as extreme unction. Perhaps for two reasons. First, this anointing concluded the series of sacramental anointings during a person's spiritual life beginning at baptism and followed by confirmation and perhaps holy orders and concluding with extreme unction. Second, this anointing more and more was used for those in extremis or at the point of death. This is where now we start seeing the actual purpose of this because this is used predominantly at one's death. You know, we're given, uh, the priest will give an individual who's dying the last rites. That's the extreme unction. Responding to the Protestants' denial of this sacrament, the Council of Trent decreed in its doctrine on the sacrament of extreme unction in 1551. This sacred anointing of the sick was instituted by Christ our Lord as a true and proper sacrament of the New Testament. It is alluded to indeed by Mark, but it is reckon, but is recommended to the faithful and promulgated by James the Apostle and brother of the Lord. All right. Excuse me. All right. The Second Vatican Council addressed the usage of the sacrament in its Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy in 1963. Extreme unction, which may also and more fittingly be called anointing of the sick, is not a sacrament for those only who are at the point of death. Now they're clarifying it in 1963 because it has been predominantly used and administered for those at the point of death. Excuse me. All right. Uh, hence, as soon as one of the faithful begins to be in danger of death from sickness or old age, the fitting time for him to receive the sacrament has certainly arrived. Now, they make one statement that it is not only for those who are at death, but then they say, but this is the most opportune time or proper time for them to receive this sacrament. The fitting time for him to receive this sacrament has certainly already arrived. Moreover, the council highlighted the healing ministry of the church and the salvific healing of our Lord. Through the sacred anointing of the sick and the prayer of her priests, the entire church commends the sick to the suffering and glorified Lord, imploring for them relief and salvation. She exhorts them, moreover, to associate themselves freely with the passion and death of Christ. 
the council recommended that a continuous rite be prepared, which would include confession, anointing, and viaticum. Now, I don't know what that, let me look up that word, viaticum, see what that means. Uh, uh oh, back up. Viaticum, let's see what that means. Okay, viaticum means that is when the Eucharist is given to a person who is near or in danger of death. The last rites. Okay. Viaticum. Uh huh. All right, let's see. I'm looking for something here. Okay. Oh, good morning everyone who is joining us this morning. Alright, so um, those of you that are joining us for the first time, this is our teaching on the question is Catholicism, Catholicism Christianity. We're talking about the different uh, doctrines. We're on the, the area now, the doctrines uh, and disciplines of uh, the Roman Church and we're specifically today discussing the uh, extreme unction and so and I'm giving you the their position first and then I'm going to deal with the opposition and the unbiblical nature or lack of biblical support uh, for this particular uh, doctrine of the Roman church alright so okay. now um, so the council also highlights you know the he healing of the Lord and they recommended that a continuous rite be prepared in which would include confession anointing and the viaticum or the giving of the Eucharist uh, at the time of death or threat of death okay if a person is in danger of dying or dying they issue what is called the last rites. Okay, in 72, Pope VI released his apostolic constitution, sacrum call, uh, unctionum inframorum. Now, you know, when, when, when the, the Pope is supposedly to have the power to um, release and declare certain positions on doctrine. And once they do put this in writing, it becomes an official uh, document or practice of the church. All right. So he says, uh, while anointing the forehead, well, let me back up. He's prescribed that a priest first lay his hands on the head of the sick in silence and then anoint the forehead and hands with the blessed oil of the infirm. While anointing the forehead, he prays, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Then while anointing the hands, he says, may the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up. The ritual provides that in accord with local custom or culture, as well as the condition of the sick person, a priest may anoint other parts of the body, for example, the area of pain or injury. If circumstances warrant it, the sacrament of penance precedes the anointing, which is then followed by the reception of Holy Communion, which serves as the Vatican for passing over to eternal life. So they pray them over. And it says that uh, note that only a priest can administer this sacrament. Now we have a few issues there. We're going to address that a little bit more later. But they claim then to have the power to absolve 
Oh, excuse me. Man, absolve one of their sins at the point of death and to pray them over when, remember, salvation is uh, contingent upon one's own acknowledgement and repentance. But he's saying here, he prays a repentant prayer for them on their behalf and then prays them as a Passover uh, to eternal life. This is part of what you know they believe they, they pray they can pray them over and give them access. But only Jesus can save. Okay, the sacrament of anointing of the sick confers the particular healing gift of the Holy Ghost. Through this grace, the whole person is healed. He is strengthened to face the condition of infirmity or old age with courage and peace of heart. To trust in the will of the Lord, to resist the temptations of the devil, and to overcome anxiety over death. Sins are forgiven and any penance is completed. A person receives the strength to unite himself more closely to the passion of our Lord, atoning for his own sins as well as for those of all of the faithful. Now remember, this is the Kojic, I mean, Catholic response. Uh, Catholicism, you know, is a system, and they build this system around all of these sacraments and doctrines and rites and rituals and ceremonies and this one has to do with the um what you call it? Uh, the last confession you know the last rites um but and they base this on James but remember James was referring to praying for the sick much as the scriptures they've given for this all dealt with Jesus praying for those who were sick and healing. And then the gift of healing uh, is in reference to healing them from their sickness. Um, but this is administered primarily to those who are facing death or in danger of death. Either one. We must remember that the sacrament of anointing of the anointing of the sick, the sacrament of anointing of the sick, is not simply a last rites sacrament. Now remember, this is a clarification made in 1972, because this is what it has been all of these years, a last rites sacrament. Apparently, who is prudently judged seriously ill should be anointed. A person may be anointed before serious surgery. The elderly may be anointed to help alleviate the burden and anxiety of old age. Those who have lost consciousness or the use of reason should also be anointed if they would have asked for the sacrament if they had been able to do so. How do you know that? <clears throat> how do they know the person would have asked if they would have been able uh, they just making an assumption and assuming that and remember repentance is the act of the individual who is seeking the forgiveness of sin how do you make this confession for them on the basis of assuming that if they were conscious, they would have asked. That's not always the case. Some people would make a dying confession and repentance because they sense death being close, but not everyone would. And that is a decision, and we had to be careful because that's a decision one should make uh, when they are of sound mind and uh, uh, when they fully understand that repentance 
and, and seeking of forgiveness and confession is absolutely necessary. And one must believe on the Lord Jesus, believe that he was buried, that he rose from the dead, and they must submit to him as the Lord of their life. But they're making this uh, kind of like a get out of hell free card. They do this and uh, say that they would have asked for it if they had been able. Okay. Usually a person only receives the sacrament once during an illness, but may receive it again if his condition deteriorates. Last rites. While the sacrament should not be restricted to point of death cases alone, which is their practice, we should not trivialize it either. For instance, I remember once a parishioner asked if I would anoint her. Since she looked very well, I asked if she was going to have surgery. She replied, no, I am flying on an airplane tomorrow. After some catechesis on my part, in other words, he teaching her, she made a good confession rather than being anointed. However, given some airplanes today, maybe anointing would be appropriate. So, you, you see, now, he just answered the question for us. He did not want to do this based on their catechism. And he says, when she didn't answer the question the way uh, uh, it would appease him that this was proper to anoint her, he then gives her some catechesis or catechism teaching. And after he gave it to her, then she makes a confession rather than being anointed. Because why? This in their mind and in their practice and in their system is reserved for one who is in danger of dying or at death. The surgery would have mitigated a danger of dying. And she was well and in good health so visibly she wasn't at the door of death so rather than anoint her because she wanted to be anointed or blessed before going on an airplane he says to her no let me give you some catechesis and then you make another decision now also one should not wait to the last minute to have a loved one anointed. He said, once I was called in the middle of the night to anoint a dying person. Afterwards, I was talking with the family and I discovered that the person had been in the hospital over a week. By delaying, the person could have died without the benefit of sacrament. Wow. If a person dies, the priest cannot anoint the dead body from which the soul has already departed. Rather, he would offer the prayers for the dead. In all, Christ has given the church a beautiful sacrament for the healing of body and soul. We must be mindful of our duty to ensure that our loved ones have the benefit of this sacrament, especially as they prepare to lead this life to be joined to our Lord. So, again, even in their closing statement, they make it perfectly clear that this extreme unction is the last rites. That's what it is. It, this, this, so, uh, but let's examine what the Bible says. Uh, if there is any sick among you, this is what James says, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil, in the name of the Lord, the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. This is dealing with those who are sick among us, and the prayer of faith for healing. That is what this is about. 
He said, call for the elders of the church. These were uh, Holy Spirit given uh, gifts for man to pray and have the power to pray the prayer of faith for the healing of the sick. This is not limited to those who are dying as uh, a last minute insurance policy. You notice that they give these examples regarding uh, one, denying to anoint someone when they request it because they're not dying or in danger of death. And the other is if one doesn't call the priest in time, it's they have to now pray the prayer <laughs> for the dead because the person has been denied the opportunity for their last minute, last rites, and last minute. Um, what was the word they used? Um, sacrament. The, the benefit of sacrament. Yeah, it's last minute benefit of sacrament. Alright, let me go to my notes now. So, this though was exercised by the uh, elders of the church on a daily basis in the New Testament church. When James wrote this, he, he wrote this in order for them to understand that healing for the bodies of men uh, that power was given to the church through the Holy Spirit and that men could lay hands on the sick and they recovered much as Jesus did when he was there present with them but this extreme unction of the Roman church Now, I just read their explanation of this or and description. It is not for that purpose. They're using this to justify their last rites. Okay. Rites, rituals, and ceremonies. And this exercising of the last rites by their own admission has been limited to those in danger of dying or those who are actually dying or at the point of death. And if one does not receive this benefit of the dying sacrament, then they must then uh, receive the prayers for the dead because the soul has already departed. And of course, you know, they teach then uh, the, the purgatory process. They're not able to get these last rites. Mm. Now, um, so the extreme unction is not intended on its basis and foundation for the healing of the sick nor of the raising of them up back to health. No, we read through their own explanation, it is actually designed for the opposite. It's designed for the uh, last rites of the dead. It's not intended for the purpose of healing or raising them up. They think this person is about to die or is in danger of dying, so they're put, putting... It's like they're taking out an insurance policy, a spiritual insurance policy for them. That's what this this that's the way I'll describe it. So the extreme unction is more of an insurance policy, right? Uh, and and it it seems that the intent 
or requirement is this is only administered when there is a reasonable uh, possibility that this is what, what, how would I describe this um, the last ditch effort to save one or that there is uh, an, an expectation that this one will not recover that death is at the door and since most surgery any surgery can end in death outside of you actually dying or being at death's door surgery or the facing of surgery so before going into surgery this can take place or on your dying bed wow uh, <laughs> so, so this is not an anointing for the healing of the sick it is anointing for the crossover of the dead or dying that's what they say right from the beginning I read that they're praying for that person to be to cross over in death all right where does this come from well let's see in the many names of the Babylonian God one was called Biel Semen Lord of Heaven and it's also the name of the Son called the Son, the Lord of the Heaven. Okay. Um, and uh, there was also uh, Baal Shaman also signifies Lord of Oil. And those are kind of like synonym names. Lord of Heaven, Lord of Oil. Uh, and uh, who writes? Herodotus makes a statement uh, that explains this. Let me find it. Okay. The name Beel, Shaman, Lord of Heaven, is seen also to signify Lord of Oil. This is what he says. Um, so the, the uh, who is this? Uh, uh, Belus, the Babylonian Belus, another name for, for Baal. Belus was represented as having been preserved in his sepulcher in Babylon till the time of Xerxes. His body was floating in oil. Wow. In Rome, the statue of Saturn was made hollow. And filled with oil. The olive branch, which we have already seen to have been one of the symbols of the Chaldean God, had evidently the same hieroglyphical meaning, for as the olive was the oil tree, so an olive branch emblematically signified a son of oil or an anointed. Hence the reason that the Greeks in coming before their gods in the attitude of suppliance, de uh, deprecating their wrath and entreating their favor, came to the temple on many occasions bearing an olive branch in their hands. As the olive branch was one of the recognized symbols of their Messiah, whose great mission uh, it was to make peace between God and man, so in bearing this branch of the anointed one, they thereby testify that in the name of that anointed one, they came seeking peace. Now the worshipers of this uh, B.L. Shaman, Lord of Heaven and Lord of Oil, were anointed in the name of their God. It was not enough that they were anointed with spittle. They were also anointed, anointed with magical ointment of the most powerful kind 
and these ointments were the means of introducing into their bodily system such, such drugs as tended to excite their imaginations and add to the power of the magical drinks they received. So they drugged them that they might be prepared for the visions and revelations that were to be made to them in the mysteries. These unctions, says uh, Salverti, were exceedingly frequent in the ancient ceremonies. Before consulting the oracle of Trophonius, they were rubbed with oil over the whole body. This preparation certainly concurred to produce the desired vision. Before being admitted to the mysteries of the Indian sages, Apollonius and his companion were rubbed with oil so powerful that they felt as if uh, they were bathed with fire. Wow. This was professedly an unction in the name of the Lord of Heaven to fit and prepare them for being admitted in vision into his awful presence. The very same reason was suggested such an unction before initiation on this present scene of things would naturally plead more powerfully still for a special unction when the individual was called not in vision but in reality to face the mystery of mysteries his personal introduction into the world unseen and eternal thus the pagan system naturally developed itself into extreme unction this is from Journal of Prophecy of 1853. Now, and here's its purpose. Its votaries were anointed for their last journey. This rite and ritual from uh, the pagan system was used for an individual's last journey. That by the double influence of superstition and powerful stimulants introduced into the frame by the only way in which it might then be possible, their minds might be fortified at once against the sense of guilt and the assaults of the king of terrors. Guilt for what? Their sins and wrongdoing. From this source and this alone, there can be no doubt came the extreme unction of the papacy, which was entirely unknown among Christians till corruption was far advanced in the church. It was not known uh, and this is Bishop Gibson says uh, this was not known in the church for a thousand years. Wow. Long time. This was, this, this was not known in the church for a thousand years. This practice of the prayer of the dead. Ooh. Well, that's what I all I have right now on the unction. Uh, so we explored the, the Catholic straight answers and then uh, Hislop's uh, commentary on it. Uh, we're going to redo this this evening for the 5 p.m. group and then what's tomorrow tomorrow is man, today Wednesday wow we're moving along yeah today is Wednesday okay so tomorrow we will not be having session I'm taking tomorrow off Thursday I'm taking Thursday off all day and when we come back, we're going to get started on purgatory and prayers for the dead. Oh, Lord. That is something else. Well, man, we really going to get into some, some, some stuff. You know, we'll talk about that purgatory and the prayers for the dead. All right. Thank you all for joining this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for your loving kindness and tender mercies. And thank you for 
your understanding and revelation of thy word. We ask now that you would continue. Bless us throughout the rest of this day. For this is the day that you have made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Bless and keep us now as our prayer. In, in Jesus name. Amen. Alright you all. Thank you all for joining this morning. We will see you back at 5 p.m. On Live at 5. Uh, you all have a wonderful and blessed day. And as always. In parting. God loves you and I love you. There is not a thing you can do about it. Go and be blessed in the name of the Lord Jesus. A moment of truth opened up my eyes. A moment of truth. A moment of truth like the sunrise. A moment of truth. Made me realize I'm on